All right, I guess we better get uh, started here. Title of this talk is uh, Types Don't Know Pound. Actually, that's Types Don't Know Hash. Uh, my name is Howard Hennett. I work for Ripple Labs, and I'm thrilled to be here at CPPCon 2014. So today I'm going to be talking about a, a new way to hash types. Now I'm not going to be talking about a new algorithm, but rather a new infrastructure for, for hashing types. Uh, the technique I'm talking about uh, is being considered for standardization. Uh, it has not been accepted, and there's no uh, guarantee that it will be accepted. In fact, the odds are probably against it. Um, however, uh, whether or not the committee standardizes this infrastructure, uh, and if they do, the soonest would be C++17, so that's three years away. Uh, if you like this technique, you can start using it today. Uh, there's source code that I can point you to at the end of the talk. It's a GitHub account. You can download the code uh, and use everything that you're seeing here today if you like it. And I encourage you to do so. I, I, I think it's a great new technique. Uh, if you're interested in hashing types and putting them into unordered containers and that sort of thing. Uh, also, if there's any uh, questions during the talk, I'm the type, type of speaker that, you know, is fine with interruptions. Just uh, shout out. Might be best if you use the, uh, the microphone there in the center of the room. If you have a question, just get up from your seat. And there you go, Nevin. Thank you. Um, so uh, because I only have an hour, this, this technique is fairly simple, but there's some, some details to it that, that can get kind of complicated. Uh, I will mention those details as I come to them, uh, but I won't dwell on them. This talk will concentrate on the, uh, just the, the high points of this technique, just because I want to give you the idea of what's going on. And when I come to something that I'm really proud of or think is really important, you'll see one of these, uh, these stars beside it. So if you're multitasking, maybe checking your email or something, uh, if you see one of these stars, that's when you really should look up and, and pay attention, because uh, that's the part that I really want you to hear. Uh, as I mentioned, details will be mentioned in passing, mainly just to let you know that the details exist, that we've thought about these details, but I won't be dwelling on uh, a lot of the nitty gritty. But my main point when I mention details uh, is to just let you know that they exist, um, let you know that we haven't forgotten about such details. Uh, and if you want to learn more about them, uh, you can read about them in the, uh, in the standard proposal, and I'll give you a link to that as well. And uh, know that the details are fully fresh, uh, fleshed out in the reference implementation. So uh, it's not that we were skimping on the details in, uh, in the actual code, just in the presentation. So some of the issues that I want to talk about is uh, the first one is how should one combine hash codes from your from your bases and data members? That is, when I'm when I'm talking about types, I don't really care about hashing the ints and hashing strings. I'm talking about the classes that you guys write, which are usually made up of several strings or a vector or ints or what have you. Um, once you hash each of those pieces, how do you combine them together in a, in a good way? And and once you do create that, how do you know if you have a good hash function or not? Um, a lot of times if you're just using standard hash, the specific algorithm for standard hash isn't specified, so you really don't know what algorithm you happen to be using except that it was supplied by your, your standard lib implementer. And if somehow you knew that you weren't happy with your hash function by some kind of measurement, how would you go about changing it? How much work do you have to do? That's really what this entire infrastructure is about, is finding ways to figure this out and finding ways to easily, easily switch from one hashing algorithm to another. I'm not going to be uh, suggesting any specific hashing algorithm, although I will dwell on one for uh, certain reasons, and when I get to those, I'll, I'll tell you about that. So to start off the, uh, the whole thing, I'm going to keep using this uh, class customer as just as, as an example. It's got a couple of strings in it, it's got an int in it, and I just want to explore different ways of hashing this relatively simple type as an example. So uh, the way people usually start doing this, you know, you might have a, a hash code function or however you want to name it, and people often use standard hash, and you know, you hash your first name, you hash your last name, you hash your int, you're left with three hash codes, 
but you only hit, get to return one of them, so somehow you've got to combine all these hash codes together. And there's a, a boost function called hash combine uh, that'll do this for you, and that's even been proposed for, for standardization. And uh, that will smash all these, uh, all these separate hash codes into one uh, by some unknown algorithm. So is this a good hash algorithm? Well, we, we don't really know what this is doing. We don't know what hash combine is doing. And so we, we really don't know, besides testing, if this is a good hash algorithm. So you might test it and discover, oh, this is my sample data set and it's colliding uh, this amount of time. Is that good or bad? Well, the only way to really tell is to try a different hash algorithm and see if your number of collisions goes up or down. And you might also be curious about whether the hash function executes slower or faster with this alternate, uh, alternate hash algorithm. So to do this, uh, you know, alternate ha hash algorithm, how do we do that? What do we, what do we need to do to use some other hash algorithm? So as just an example, my other hash algorithm is, is going to be this thing called FNV1A. Um, it's a fairly old hash algorithm. It's actually surprisingly good, but it's not the best in the world. Uh, the technical reason that I've chosen to concentrate on this one is because the whole thing fits on one slide. It is, the, it is one of the simplest hash algorithms in, in, the, in the world. But despite the fact that it's so simple, it contains all the key functions, all the key characteristics, I should say, of almost every hash algorithm out there. So its simplicity is great. It's got everything I want to show you, and yet this thing is really very simple. And don't worry about all these strange numbers here because those aren't part of the characteristics that, I'm, that I want to show you. Uh, and I, I'll explain those characteristics, characteristics in a minute. But at any rate, if we're going to use this other hash algorithm, just taking FNV1A as an example, uh, we might use it just like we use standard hash. Uh, we hash the first name, we hash the last name, we hash the int, and now we've got three hash codes, and we've got to fall back to boost hash combine to, uh, to clump these all together. So I'm not really happy with this solution. For one, if I want to use FNV1A, I want to use FNV1A, or if I want to use SIPHash or Spooky or whatever, I want to use that algorithm, and I don't really want to pollute it with this hash combined step. It's a well-known fact that good hash algorithms are really difficult to design. So uh, we've still got this, this hash combined thing, and, and I'm not happy with that because this is polluting my FNV1A. So the first thing I want to do is get rid of this hash combine. And to do that, I first want to talk about the characteristics or the anatomy of your typical hash function. Hash functions, first of all, they have a state. Uh, sometimes the state can be very simple. In the case of FNV1A, our internal state is just a single size T. But in general, a hash algorithm could have like an array of size Ts, five of them, 10 of them, whatever, or really any arbitrary state. And the first job of the algorithm is to initialize this state to some initial state. The second, in the second phase of a hash algorithm uh, computation, it consumes bytes into its internal state. And then there's a finalization stage where it's no longer consuming bytes, but it's continuing to mix or do whatever to this hash state. You might think of it as the boost hash combine phase, but it's particular to every specific hashing algorithm. And that's really is all there is to any hashing algorithm is these three phases. And I'm going to be a little bit repetitive. I'm going to keep coming back to these three phases uh, because it's, it's, it's key to making this whole system work. So let's, take an, uh, let's go back to our example uh, FNV1A. The, uh, the initialization state is just this one line. Here's our internal state, a single size T. And to initialize it, we simply cram this number into it. And it's not important what this number is. Well, it's important for the algorithm what this number is. But it's not important to this talk what that number is. It's important that that is the initialization phase right there. It's very simple. Other hash algorithms will have much more complicated initialization stages. But uh, this one fits on one slide and is easy, relatively easy to understand. 
So the next four lines are the phase where you consume bytes into the internal state. And then finally, this is our finalization state here. That's about as simple as it can get. It's the identity operation. Uh, to finalize this algorithm, you simply return the single size T as the hash code. Uh, other hash algorithms will have much more complicated finalization states, uh, but we get to go with identity here. So um, consider repackaging this algorithm to make these three separate stages separately accessible. Now, how would you go about that? Um, the, next, the next slide is gonna do a, a neat little animation, and the animation isn't there just to be cute. It's to emphasize that when I repackage this thing, I'm not going to change any of this source code. I'm just gonna move it around. I'm gonna turn this function into a class, and you'll be able to access each of these three phases separately. So, looks like this. Now we have a class. We have a default constructor that's responsible for initializing the internal state. Uh, I'm using C++11 here to implement my default constructor. That's just a detail to help me fit all this on one slide. It's not really important. In fact, it's not that important that it be a default constructor. You could construct this thing any way you want. But with a simple algorithm like this, uh, default construction seems to be the right the right technique. Then I've got, you can call it an update operator, but an operator paren that takes the, uh, the same arguments as before, that consumes bytes into the internal state. And the, the key thing here is to recognize that I can call this over and over and over again. I can call it more than just one time since it's uh, now separately accessible. And then my finalization state, I've coded just as an explicit conversion operator to a result type, which is just a uh, size t. Uh, when the, in the repackaging, you can imagine that for other algorithms, this, this could be arbitrarily complicated, uh, but here it's just very simple. Oh, and this part's really important. So separating one algorithm into three phases, that's key to, to this whole technique. Let's go back to our customer class, and again, look at how we might write our hash code algorithm. So. The first step in using this is simply to default construct our, our FNV1A algorithm. Question, yes. Sure. So the, qu the question is, is can, we, can we stick a const here? Um, I would think generally no. For, the, for this particular algorithm, you really could. But in, in non-trivial, well, I shouldn't say non-trivial, in more complicated uh, algorithms, this will change the state further as it's doing the finalization stage. And so you would have to make your state mutable if you wanted to make this const. So you might as well keep it non-const. Yes, so you're exactly right. This should be called only once. And we can, we'll, we'll be able to wrap that up into other code to enforce that, that invariant. Yes? That's a reasonable, a reasonable tweak to this algorithm. You know, we could, one could think about doing that. Uh, any other questions before I move on? Okay. So, I'm sorry? Oh, uh, the, the comment was we, we could uh, do an R value ref on the finalization stage, uh, an R value ref this, so that uh, you, would, you would have to say move uh, paren and then convert. It would get, the syntax would get a little bit messy, but you could do it. And, and, it, and it's not a bad suggestion. Um, so the first thing we need to do to use it is default construct our, our algorithm. Then we call the update stage for each of the strings and the age. And then we call the finalization stage, uh, which is uh, just uh, explicitly convert it to a size T. And we have no more hash combined. So the important thing now is we're hashing our entire 
uh, relatively complicated data structure with FNV1A. And if you think about it, it, we would get the exact same result if we copied the first name and the last name and the int all to contiguous memory and fed the whole thing to FNV1A at the same time. Uh, the, the result would be exactly the same. So this is really just a nice technique for making your discontiguous memory look contiguous for your, to your hashing algorithm so that you don't have to do this hash combine step. So that's a win. So anybody have any questions about that stage before I go on? Because that's kind of important. Okay. Uh, note that um, this same technique can be used with almost every existing hashing algorithm. So in, in later on in the talk, I'm going to show that we're going to want to switch not only to FNV1A, but any other hashing algorithm you can think of or that somebody has written up. It's going to be very important to switch from one to the another very easily. Uh, so uh, making this, uh, recognizing this is, is very important. Now, what if we want to put customer in, in oh yes, please go ahead. <laughs> that, excellent question. There is one hashing algorithm on the planet that I found that this technique does not work well with, and that is city hash. Um, now city hash is a, is a great hashing function, but it has a property that it wants to see the entire length of the hashing of the memory right up front. And so the only way to really use this technique with city hash is instead of consuming the bytes as you see them, to store them in a vector or something, and then do everything at once. And that would just be ridiculously expensive. Certainly easily implementable, but you don't really want to be allocating memory under your hash function. Yes? Oh, I'm not sure I'm understanding the, the, the question. Some other class. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. I, I think I'll be able to answer your question a little bit further in the talk, and if I don't, please ask it again. Yes. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not quite understanding you. Maybe if you spoke into the microphone, it, it would be louder and I could hear it. Uh, in this previous slide, you have a function which is a return result of. Instead of static cast, it's the size T, blah, 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 just... Uh, whoops. Oh, sorry, I went too, went too far here. Are, are you you're asking about this static cast here, and why is it there? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. Fair. Fair point. Uh, this is just syntax at this point. So I'd like to move on and. Uh, yeah, the syntax of this can be can be varied somewhat. You know, uh, it's just the naming. Uh, but the important point is that is the technique we're using to be able to switch from one algorithm to another, one hashing algorithm to another. Um, so, what happens if we put customer into a larger class? And let's say we've you know now we've got a class with a customer and a product and a date. And we've pre prepared each one of these with our FNV1A algorithm. And uh, how do we hash our, our larger class now? So our first try is, you know, you call hash code on, on each of these three things. And lo and behold, we, we're back with hash combine. We've got the same problem we started with. Uh, so we need to fix that. Uh, one, another way of saying this is um, this solution is not yet composable. And, and, and we want to make it composable. Uh, so let's go back to our customer class and, and fix this. And if you look at this, 
uh, we, what we really need to get rid of is constructing the hash function here and finalizing the hash function here. All customers should do is just the update stage here in the middle. So just for the time being, imagine that some other piece of code, don't have to think about where yet, is going to initialize our hash function, and some other piece of code is going to finalize it, and all customer needs to do is append to it. So with that in mind, we've got a, a function here, instead of, instead of computing the hash code right here in customer, we've got a function called hash append that gets an FNV1A object from somewhere else, appends to it, and that's it. Doesn't bother finalizing it. And we'll explain later how we get the hash code. Yes? Um, it should be a friend because we're going to use the same syntax for scalars. Uh, and so think of this as a, a swap function. Uh, this is very much like swap. Uh, and it, it doesn't have to be a friend, but it should be a namespace scope function. Um, so with this, let's now go back to sale class. Um, we have our sale class. It has a hash append. Now all it has to do is call hash append on each of it, its members. So like I was saying before, this is a bit like a swap function or even an operator equal equal. If you've got some class and you want to implement the operator equal equal on it, you usually call operator equal equal on its, all of its bases and all of its data members. And that may in turn recurse down and call operator equal equal on its bases and members, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a composable solution here. Uh, since uh, we just update state to the hash append, uh, this calls hash append, and then each one of these individual hash appends may call hash append further on its data members and so forth and so on until you get down to scalars. Uh, primitive types are, are scalars can then just um, call hash append on their, on their direct memory. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped ahead a, a little bit. Um, yes, primitive types and, and standard defined types can be, uh, can be given hash append overloads, so we can simplify this bit. This part is actually why I'm trying to get this standardized. Um, if if uh, int and unsigned long long and all those have hash appends and standard string and standard vector and tuple and pair, et cetera, et cetera. They all need hash append overloads too. Now, in the next three years, if you want to go ahead and implement this before the committee provides it for you, there is software to do this. I can point it to you. It's just a pain in the rear. It would be so helpful if the committee would say, okay, we'll supply hash append for int and long long and string and so forth and so on. And then you can write your hash appends like this instead of uh, calling the extremely ugly update operator. And this way, uh, you know, this way you let string itself define how it's going to update its state to a, a algorithm. And you let int define how it's going to update its state to an algorithm. Those are details for string and int. In other words, if you look at this in the bigger picture, each type is individually responsible for saying, this is how I want to present myself to a hashing algorithm. And so types that compose it simply have to forward to its hash append. So if all hashing algorithms follow the same interface as I've shown for FNV1A, hash append can really be templated on the hash algorithm instead of being specialized for just FNV1A and now, customer can be hashed using any hash algorithm. Uh, it doesn't have to know anything at all about FNV1A just by templating it. So another important point there. Yes, go ahead. What? So the question is, why not make hash append a, uh, a templated on two things and then specialize it? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. You, you could. Right. You you still have to specialize it for each class because it's going to be a different number of hash pins for each class depending on its data. You know how many data members it has and how many bases and what their names are, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, a minor point, it's, it's very easy to, uh, to write a variadic version of this hash append. Uh, it doesn't change anything it just except for the syntax. Uh, yes, a variadic version of hash append exists, so you can write it like this if you prefer. There's no performance difference, there's no functionality difference, but a lot of people really prefer uh, this syntax, so uh, that exists. Uh, when you get down to, to scalars, or if you have to implement this yourself because the standard committee hasn't done it for you yet, um, a hash append for an int, you know, is just take the address of the int and send in, you know, however many bytes is, is the int is long, typically four, or for a pointer, uh, take the address of the pointer, you send it in, and this is calling the update of the algorithm, and just as a reminder, those calls are uh, specifically calling into this function right here. So in general, this is going to be called for your ints and your unsigned longs and your, you know, your pointers, uh, your scalar types. And with any luck, a few years from now, that work will be done by the committee instead of ha you having to put it into your own application. So if you look at a, at a built-up uh, complicated class like sale, which is composed of customer product and date, and then if you look into customer product and date, they're going to be co composed of other things. And eventually, you drill down to scalars. And you can think of this, this class as being composed of a whole bunch of scalars and discontiguous memory. And what, this is, what hash append is doing is recursively drilling down into this data structure until it finds a scalar and then sending those bytes to the hash algorithm. This is actually very analogous to serialization. It works the same way. Uh, you, when you serialize something, you, you say, OK, serialize the first member and serialize the second member. And those, in turn, will have serialization that'll drill down until you hit something like int you know, with a value of 5, and you print out a 5. And here, we're simply sending the 5 to a hashing algorithm instead of to a stream. So this really isn't very strange. It's just that people haven't seen it in the context of hashing before. That's the only thing that makes it strange. Uh, so in general, for this technique, Every single type that you might want to hash or even somehow uh, participate in a hash computation has to have a hash append overload. And that overload will either call hash append on all its bases and members, or at least those bases and members that should participate in a hashing computation, um, or it will send bytes of its memory straight to the hash algorithm, as would an int or a long long or what have you. And no type at all is aware of any concrete hashing algorithm. That's key because you want to be able to switch from one hashing algorithm to another. So I've talked a lot about hash append, and I haven't said much about how to use it. In fact, we still don't know how we get a hash code out of this thing. Well, it turns out that assuming you've got a hash append for every type in the universe now, and perhaps the committee has helped us with, with half of those types, uh, to, to get a hash out, to get actual hash code, well, you default construct your hash algorithm. Then, for whatever your type uh, is, here I'm calling it T, you append to it, and that may in turn call hash append on each of its parts and so forth and so on until it gets down to scalars. And then you finalize the algorithm uh, with, uh, and here I've you know relatively arbitrarily chosen the uh, the explicit conversion syntax to, to finalize. So just three steps to do this. Um, of course, one step is always better than three steps. So you might wrap this up in a class, and that class is called a standard conforming hash functor. So here we've got a class, templating it on the hash algorithm. For grins, I've put a, a default template to our favorite FNV1A hashing algorithm. And uh, it's got a nested type, result type, which is, uh, the result type of the hashing algorithm. If you're putting this into unordered containers, this result type has to be a size T, so you can just think everywhere I've written result type here, just think size T. And then our three simple steps are just wrapped up in the, uh, the operator paren here. Um, 
So now that we have this conforming hash functor, you would use it just as you would any other conforming hash functor. You just drop it straight into your unordered set and now you can hash customer using standard unordered set or unordered map or, or what have you. Now I've talked a lot about switching. Oh, before I go on, question. Yes, actually, you're you're getting into one of the details that I'll uh, that I'll I'll get to on a few slides, or at least is contiguously hashable uh, at any rate. Uh, yes, sure. Um, as in the uh, right here in the construction, yes, it would. You're a couple of slides ahead of me. <laughs> Let me just catch up on the slides here real quick. Got our... That's the trouble with putting too many animations on one slide. All right. So if, uh, if we want to change hash functions, the great thing is that we don't have to, uh, to touch anything but this guy right here. We just slip in a new hash function. Here I'm using sip hash as an example. And now we're, now we're uh, hashing sale on this completely different algorithm. We just change it right at the point of use. And the key thing is here, we did not change sale one bit. And if you remember, sale is composed of other types customer, product, date, what have you. We didn't have to change those either. We can keep uh, swapping out different hashing algorithms right here, and it's very easy. And because it's very easy, it becomes trivial to experiment with different hashing algorithms, and so we can, we can compare one hashing algorithm to another, see which gives us the fewer collisions, which gives us the greater performance, uh, and and what we can do about securing against attacks if what we have to put into our unordered containers is coming from untrusted code. So, very important point here. Uh, today, when you want to switch hash algorithms, you go and you have to uh, modify each of the types that, that, are, that you want to hash. And so this gets rid of changing, uh, modifying the classes that you're hashing entirely. So getting back to, to your question, wouldn't it be useful if we, uh, if we could seed our hashing algorithms? I talked uh, on the previous slide, I briefly mentioned security. One way you guard against, uh, one way you harden your, your hash containers against attacks is to randomly seed it. Some hash algorithms, not FNV1A, but some al algorithms will allow you to seed it. So imagine you've got some git seed function here and it doesn't really matter how you implement that. Typically it might be uh, with a random number generator or what have you. You can imagine it's very easy to write a hashing algorithm that simply has a constructor that takes a seed. So how do we use that? Well, it goes much the same way. We construct it, we append to it with our type, we finalize the algorithm, and we wrap the whole thing up in a conforming hash functor. Here I just call it seeded hash. Now because these conforming hash functors are small enough to fit on one slide, that means they're easy enough that you can make as many of these things as you want. You can make an unseated hash functor, you can make a seated hash func functor, you could make uh, hash functors that uh, salted or padded this, uh, this type by appending to it either before you call hash append here or append to it with salt or padding afterward. You can do any number of things in these special purpose hash functors and I'm sure you know, if people start using this technique, like you guys, you're a lot more clever than me, you'll think of wild things to do with your hash functors, and you'll be able to because there's really only three steps here to create a hash functor, uh, you know, to, at least to create the uh, operator paren of it. So creating hash functors is, is very easy, and it's very easy to use them. You just now plug this into your, your unordered set or an unordered map right at the point of use. And so you can not only change from one hash algorithm to another, 
you can change from uh, seated hash functions to not seated hash functions back and forth to see how that affects their performance, your collisions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, very easy to experiment. It's also easy to set up defaults. Uh, you don't always have to, uh, to use unordered set directly and, and plug in a, a custom hash function. Now with uh, uh, using uh, template aliases, you can just create your own template alias, make your hash function default whatever you like, and now whenever you use, I called mine hash set, whenever you use hash set, it's going to be using your favorite hash by default. So this doesn't have to make your day-to-day -day earlier use a lot uglier. Uh, you just set one of these up wherever everybody can see it and go to town with it. So I, I mentioned that there were going to be a few details. Uh, one of them is this trait. Uh, there's a trait called is contiguously hashable. And what it basically says is can you feed this type's bytes directly into the hash functor uh, with it using its update operator. So it's going to be true for twos complement ints and that sort of thing. Uh, be true for pointers on, on most platforms. It's actually not true for floating point types. A, uh, a IEEE floating point type isn't contiguously hashable because uh, one of the requirements for being contiguously hashable is that every bit pattern uh, should, should, every bit pattern will hash to a different value and thus every bit pattern should not be equal to any other bit pattern. And if you recall in, in floating points, negative zero is equal to zero, but they're represented with different bit patterns. But since they're equal, you want them to hash to the same hash code. So a hash append for floating point might set negative zero to positive zero before sending itself to the, to the update uh, algorithm. So is contiguously hashable is also uh, a performance optimization for types like tuple, string, and vector. Um, string is composed of this contiguous array of chars. Uh, we will know by this trait that char will be contiguously hashable, I hope. And so this tells string that it can send its entire data buffer at once uh, to the hashing algorithm update function. And uh, the more modern hashing algorithms, the, the more memory you send them to them at once, the faster they work. So that's, that's really the main motivation for having this trait here, is optimization for string, vector, and even tuple, if you can prove that there's no padding between the different elements, uh, then it can also be contiguously hashable. Um, and uh, there's, there's a way to do that, and I don't want to go into the, those details here, but it's in, the, it's in the source code. It's not terribly hard, but I really would like the committee to supply that code instead of asking you guys to do it at least three years from now. Uh, do you have a question, Nevin? Or? Oh, okay. All right. Um, so another detail uh, is... Uh, there does exist a, a way to write hash append for pimple types. Pimple types is where you have a uh, incomplete type in your in your header uh, that's surrounded by a handle object, and you go to your source, and that's where you expand your 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 incomplete type to a complete type. And if you re recall, all the hash append uh, functions that I've shown you so so far are templated on the hash algorithm. So you might have been wondering, well, gee, if I'm in a source file, how do I get this? generic hash function into my pimple. And uh, the way you do it is with what I call a, uh, a type erasing hash algorithm adapter. And you can think of this, it's, it's very analogous to standard function. Standard function is a type erasing functor adapter. When you use a standard function, you don't know what type of functor you've put into it, except to, unless you happen to have access to the way you constructed it. And you simply call it without knowing what type of functor is in there? A class A, a function pointer, uh, a lambda, you, you just don't know it at the point of call. So uh, there's a, a type erasing hash algorithm adapter, works exactly the same way. In fact, it's implemented by using a standard function. Um, it's, it's in the source code. It's more than I wanted to present here, but I wanted to let you know that if you're writing, if you're using the, the pimple idiom, uh, which is a you know very good idiom. Uh, you're not out, you're not left out in the cold. You can use this technique with the pimple idiom. 
Um, finally, if you're concerned about Indian, uh, there's a way to handle that. Uh, this is actually true at my company. We, we have a, uh, a situation where we have a network of computers and we're hashing data structures using um, SHA-256 for security purposes uh, just to preserve the integrity of the data structure. If one machine on this side of the node hashes this data structure and another machine on the, on the other side of the network hashes the exact same data structure with the same values in it, it better get the same hash code Otherwise, these two computers aren't going to be able to agree about the contents of, of what they're hashing. And uh, the hashing is important, of course, for security purposes. If these machines happen to be of two different Indians, but all, otherwise they have identical layout for stuff like uh, ints and, and pointers, uh, these two machines ought to be able to agree on, on how to hash these things. So there's, uh, within, within this whole technique, there's a... Uh, a trigger for saying, before you hash your 64-bit int, swap the, swap the bytes on it because the Indian isn't right on your native platform. Um, that detail exists, it's in the reference implementation, but I, I didn't want to take time on going into it today. Uh, so moving along here, um, in summary, um, every type that may be hashed or participate in a hash computation must have a hash append overload. And this is really the hard part, and this is why I'm trying to get this technique standardized, because if we get the committee to write hash append for int and unsigned long long and pointers and enums and pairs and tuples and vectors and strings, that will take a huge amount of uh, work out of implementing this technique for yourself. It'll take practically all of the work out of it. As it is today, uh, the way you're gonna handle this is download my source code from the GitHub reference, and all of that code is in there to do it for you. Um, on the other hand, when you're writing hash append for your own type, it's very easy to do. It's about the same amount of effort as writing operator equal equal for your type. You, uh, you hash append each of your bases and members, and it's relatively straightforward, as I demonstrated for the example customer class and the example sale class. So one mildly uh, difficult part is any hash algorithm that, that you want to use in this te technique, it must be adapted to expose to three phases, initialization, updating, and finalization. But note that you only have to do this once for a hash algorithm, and then that hash algorithm is good to use for all of your types. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like the STL, where before the STL we had, uh, if we had, might have N algorithms and M containers and to, to give each container the, the correct number of algorithms, you had to write n, n times m source code. Well, that's the situation today if you're using the standard hash t style of hashing your functions. If you've got n hashing algorithms and a type that's made of m subtypes and you want to change hashing algorithms, you're talking about writing n times m source code to, to arrange that. Using this technique, we've separated it out so that you only have to uh, adapt n algorithms and then write hash append for your m types, and so that's only n plus m uh, source code instead of n times m. Uh, that's the, this decoupling is, is the whole backbone of this, this technique. It's the whole rationale for it to exist. Um, and finally, the probably a, a very important point, um, Hash functors are very easy to write. All they have to do is initialize the algorithm, update it with an item to be hashed, and finalize the algorithm. And this is very important that it be easy because you need to be free to write hash functors to do different things, like hash functor that doesn't seed, a hash functor that does seed. There's very uh, there's uh, at least two different ways I can think of that you might want to handle random seeding. You might want to have hash functors that get one random seed every time they're constructed, or you might want to just get one random seed when your application starts up and use that for every hash functor. Both ways are right. Both ways have advantages and disadvantages. And because it's so easy to write hash functors, then you can, you can create whichever technique is right for you. We don't have to depend on the committee to standardize it and get the answer wrong for you. And if you do all this work, what are the benefits you get? Again, 
you get to experiment with different hashing algorithms very easily. Um, hashing algorithms are, you can either use non-seated hashing algorithms or seated hashing algorithms and switch bet between them very easily. Uh, I talked about getting rid of uh, boost, com uh, I'm sorry, hash combined from boost. The hashing algorithms that you use are exactly as the authors of those hashing algorithms intended. They're no longer polluted with these combining steps. And finally, what I think is the, the most important point, when you're writing hash support for your type, you don't have to get in bed, you don't have to marry any specific hashing algorithm. You write your hash support once, and you know that it's good for any hashing algorithm whatsoever. Uh, so clients who use your type, maybe three years after you've written it, they can decide at that point, maybe I want to use FNV1A, maybe I want to use Spooky or SIPHash or even SHA-256, whatever. That decision is down the road and can be made by different people for their different applications. So types don't know hash. A type should only know what parts of itself should be presented to a hash algorithm. It should not be aware of any specific hash algorithm. So that's the title, Types Don't Know Hash. Um, I've been promising this link for quite a while. It's about time I give it to you. Uh, don't worry about memorizing this uh, because I'm sure these slides will be made publicly available. Uh, but it's on my GitHub. It's called Hash Append. And within that directory, the whole meat of this is in one source file called hashappend.h. But there's also a bunch of other ha uh, files in that source. Um, for example, there's the SIP hash adapter, the Spooky adapter, the SHA-256 adapter. There's the type erasing uh, hash append uh, functor adapter, whatever you call it. Um, all kinds of, so when you, when you download it, there'll be a bunch of files in there. Uh, but don't be scared off by that. You can get started just with the hash append.h function. Uh, and if you want to know more about those details, they're in this paper here. This is the paper that was submitted to the committee in 3980. And you can find it right at this link. And uh, also should mention uh, Bloomberg got excited about this. And they've, uh, they've implemented it in their open source, what they call uh, BSL, I believe, or BDSL. I can't remember what they call it. But they're all excited about it, too. And they've implemented it. So it's certainly implementable by other people besides myself, it's implementable by you guys. You just go here and go to town. Uh, questions? Okay, I, I'll try to be quick. Um, okay, I'm the, really nervous now. <laughs> uh, uh, the difficult. Uh, um, I'm curious about the difficulty with implementing this for the built-in and uh, standard library types. Is it just the sheer legwork of writing hash pen for all those types, or is, is there an, an obstacle to doing that in user code? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it is largely the legwork of just because there's so many types. Right. But there's some types that you could Im implement only suboptimally. Sub uh, for example, deck is a, a, a contiguous array of s several contiguous arrays. Uh, the way that if you don't know the internals of deck, you just have to send your elements one at a time. If you do know the internals of deck and if the element is contiguously hashable, you can send an entire chunk of elements one at a time. So the, the standard library can really do a better job than, than we can. Um, vector bool is another problem, but vector bool is <laughs> always a problem. So, Okay, thanks. So... This technique or this sort of paper gets adopted. Do you imagine that um, we'll start having the idea with a? If I'm writing my class, I'll start saying, "Okay, well, I need to have certain things I'll write, such as um, swap is one of those things. That maybe hash append would be one of those standard functions that you write, and then you have an external function that just is, say, maybe the norm for your type of classes. Should that be maybe a good practice to start adopting? So you have well. Yeah, I'd, have hashable types. If, or if you want to supply a type that then someone has the option of putting in hashes. If you are excited enough about this technique to go here and download it and start using it, the answer is yes. <laughs> if, if you're not that excited about it, you might want to take a wait and see approach and see what the committee does. Uh, then, you know, 
And if the committee standardizes it, then at that point, yes, hash append will be one of those functions that you just need to write along with operator equal equal and swap and so forth and so on. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Um, one is because operator equal equal and hash, you know, have a mathematical relationship. Yes. Do you have any good strategies for keeping those in sync without having to essentially rewrite the same exact boilerplate code in every spot? Is it like using things like standard tie for this stuff? Or? I, the, the, what I recommend is always use operator equal equal, equal for your predicate in your unordered containers. Uh, doing anything else, uh, you're just off in the quicksand. You, it gets complicated. And if you really need to go there, just go there and don't use hash append. Because it's, uh, or, you know, yeah, I suppose if you, if you really wanted to, you could sync hash append with some weird version of operator equal equal, but yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing that. I would just write a special hash, if you had to do something besides match with sync with operator equal equal, I would just write a custom hash function and, and use that. And my other question is, so part of a good hash function is dependent on, say, how the buckets are allocated in an ordered set. You know, are there a prime number of buckets? Are there a power of two? Do you envision someday a proposal maybe coming to, you know, tie those kind of things together? Because you could pick, because the standard doesn't expose what kind of number of buckets you, what kind of algorithm an ordered set uses. Yeah. Do you see some kind of I, way so you can take advantage of that? I, I don't see that coming... I, I don't see a way to, to take advantage of that in the future, um, uh, and I don't see any proposal that, uh, coming down the pike in that department. I will say that I am, I am biased on one way, that the libc++ implementation will switch back and forth between whichever you like. You give it a power of two buckets, and it'll keep power of two as it doubles. You give it a prime number of buckets, and it'll keep, as it doubles, it'll find the next prime. So, yes? This is great, and I wish I'd had it like four years ago for exactly the same application as you mentioned earlier? I'm just sorry I'm late. <laughs> I tried my best. Um, what kind of pushback do you see against this type of thing? Um, the, the pushback I'm seeing so far is on what I call niggling details that, that I don't care a lot. Like what is the signature of the update operator in the hash functor that, that we need to specialize in? Should it be void pointer or pointer to unsigned character or whatever? I can't get real excited about that question, but um, but but a lot of people are really excited about about that part. Thank you. Um, and other pushbacks are some people don't have as good an overview of the entire system as you guys hopefully do right now, because this is the first time I've given this presentation, and so people keep trying to improve it, and that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> So you said that we um, have to write hash append only once, and two questions about that. First question, perhaps we can bring it down to zero. Um, and what I mean by that is that I think people are thinking about um, introducing some sort of reflection in C++, and then you could write a generic automated way to like, scan, find all the members, and automatically put them in, in the hash. So do you think that makes sense? And the second question is, perhaps sometimes we need to do it more than once, which means you know, if you put things into sorted containers, you want to sort them differently sometimes. So perhaps a type, you want it to present itself to the hashing algorithm differently on different occasions. So does that make sense? And how would you go about it? Because you only have one hash band. Uh, so the uh, second question first, I guess. Um, I, I have not come up with an application where I wanted to change what was represented to the, to the hash functor as opposed to changing the hashing algorithm. I've, I've had plenty of, plenty of motivation to change my hashing algorithms, but, but not what's presented, and I, I don't know of a good way to handle that outside of something gross like ifdef. Um, and I'm sorry, what, could you repeat your first question? It's already blown, um, skipped out of my mind. Automatic hash append through oh. reflection. Um, an interesting way to do that might be with equal default. Um, I don't know whether that's technically possible, it would definitely have to be opt-in because uh, not every type wants to present everything it has to a hash algorithm. For example, you'd never want to have vector present its capacity to a hash algorithm. So I don't see it as uh, something that would be completely automatic. It would have to be opt-in whatever syntax is used. <laughs> uh, have, you, have you thought about 
generalizing it so that instead of just hash a pen, it's just any kind of function that you for every kind of primitive for, type. For, so for. you can use this for serialization and comparators and hash and everything. I, I actually have thought about that, and um, I, I I don't know of a clean way to do it yet yeah. because you need to do different things. Floating point is is my poster child example on that. For serialization, you want to keep the difference between negative zero and zero, and for hashing, you want to hide the difference between negative zero and zero. And so I don't have a good solution for that very problem. So in, the, in some hashing strategies, you actually want to like insert the lengths in there as well so that you can reduce your aliasing, you know, like a name mangling kind of thing. Right. Um, how would that plug in here if you wanted to opt well, into that? In the, in the specification I have right now, if you take vector, for example, the specification is that vector will send every element of its, in its container to hash append, and then it will also hash append its length at the end of that. And that way you don't uh, accidentally get aliasing between uh, vectors of vectors, uh, which can happen if you don't append the length. Thank you. Uh, hey. Um, just on the sort of serialization point, so I, I work a lot with boost serialization, and I do think that it is sort of a little, it may seem like these have very similar interfaces, and like, oh, we could have some sort of omnibus, you know, um, introspection solution, but there are definitely cases when you want to be different. But I think one thing that you may want to look into is you could probably hijack a lot of the boost serialization code that supports all the boost containers to add support for the boost containers to sort of the reference implementation. Okay. Because I think I think for a lot of them the code's probably there and we just need some minimum changes or wrappers. Well, that's a very interesting suggestion. Thank you very much. Thanks. Is there two questions? Number one, is there a, a sort of an implicit assumption here that the state of your hash, func hash function object is copy assignable? Yes, there is. That's a actually an uh, excellent question. The the hash function has to be copy assignable and copy constructible for very subtle reasons, and it mainly has to do with that, uh, that type erasing hash, hash append adapter that I saw. It has to uh, take the hash functor and, and copy it and send it on and then get it back. And related to that then, do you foresee a provision or a way to provide an externally generated seed so that I could create hash function, uh, hash function objects in different unordered containers that have the same initial state with a technique that doesn't smell like a static member variable. Um, sure, you could uh, you can you could have the seed in the in the hash functor. Uh, every time you construct one, it could get a, a new seed, a new random seed, and so you could put one hash functor over here, same out, same hash algorithm, another one over here same hash algorithm and just have them differently seated and I, I, I want to seed those two objects the same oh in that case you could you know just have a uh, <coughs> global uh, <laughs> well, that's what I'm that's what I'm getting at a portion of the interface that would allow me to do that without using global or it, static yeah yeah the only the first thing that comes to my mind is just make it a static of your of your hash hash functor but okay. Yeah, pa pass your seat in explicitly, sure. Apologies if I missed that. I was just wondering, uh, is it possible to customize the return type of the hash function because currently it seems to be assuming size t all the time? Uh, yes, in fact, that's the, the reason that the result type was up there is so that you can customize that. For example, the, uh, the SHA-256 doesn't return a size t. It returns a 256-bit animal. And so that's the reason result type is there. Um, uh, as I'm sure you know, in, in C14, the uh, ordered maps got uh, heterogeneous uh, 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 lookup functionality so that I can, I can do find with a key type that's different uh, so long as they're uh, comparable. But that wasn't added to the, uh, the unordered containers because nobody was sure how to, uh, how to make sure that the, ha the, uh, the hash function works the same on different types. Uh, this seems like it could help with that uh, because it's all about sort of delegating to the 
uh, to the implementation. Do you have any thoughts on whether this could address that problem? I, that's a really interesting question. I haven't given that a lot of thought, but just off the cuff here, um, at least it puts the power of what gets presented to a hash algorithm in your hands, and it puts the power of what the hash algorithm is into your hands. And so I can, I can easily see that if you set your, your key up, your external key up to present the same information as your internal key, then you're golden. And then if, if it presents different information, if it presents different information, then you're not. Yeah. Um, so in, in that sense, it, it certainly sounds doable. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you'd have to be on your guard and, and make sure that it did indeed present the exact same information yeah. uh, and that, yeah, and then it should just work. <laughs> um, just as, as an aside along, along the same lines of thought, I actually wrote a hashing algorithm that I called debug hash that does nothing but collect the bytes and then when you convert it to a size T, it just prints them all out to standard error so that in hex format so that you can debug your hash append algorithm, which would come in very handy in doing that, that very exercise. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much.